You're watching The American on ESPN. A picture-perfect November Saturday in New Orleans, and what's better than brunch and some football? We've got a couple of teams hungry to close out their season strong as the South Florida Bulls take on the Tulane Green Wave. And alongside former LSU and NFL tight end Brian Kinchin, Jack Benjamin on end. What's better than a nice early kickoff for us here? A couple teams whose seasons haven't gone quite as planned so far. Tulane only one win, South Florida two wins. But you look around, there's a lot of talent on the field and a lot of optimism for both teams. Well, Tulane took Tulsa to overtime last week. It was a really good game. And South Florida, no different against Cincinnati. Last week played well. And even the week before that against Houston, Really good outings, perform well, but just not getting the wins. And that's been the big issue. But they need to get some wins, get them pro propelled into the offseason, and get on a good, good, a good note. Both of these coaches very excited about their young quarterbacks. A couple of freshmen. We look at South Florida's Timmy McLean first, a guy who's had his best two passing yardage outings back-to-back, -back, and he can be dynamic with his legs. Yeah, this guy can really move. He's got a lot of the elements where people are raving about what his potential might be. He moves the ball well in the pocket with his legs and even with his arm just making plays and awareness that is as a freshman you just don't see and he's developed well he's continuing that hopefully today missed a game earlier in the season at ECU with a little injury but really playing well lately and making things happen this offense is starting to gel on the field yeah, they've really gotten off to a, a couple of great starts with him at the helm. Meanwhile, Michael Pratt for Tulane back on September the 4th was terrific against Oklahoma. Has hit a couple of bumps in the road along the way here. But again, a guy with a lot of talent. What do you need to see out of him today? Yeah, Pratt's been banged up a little bit. He loves to run hard and run physical, but it's something that inspires his teammates. But his coaches aren't really crazy about it because he gets banged up. This is time in practice, and so he doesn't get as many reps. And so now late in the season where the last couple of weeks he's played a little better, this offense has slowed down a little bit, and it's allowed him to be able to be a better passer, be a better manager of the game. And this offense really needs to find an identity here today against South Florida. Well, the Bulls have lost seven straight conference road games. Tulane has lost eight straight games overall. Something's got to give today. A couple of teams collide in the Crescent City next. American Athletic Conference football on ESPN Plus is presented by Justin's, the official and exclusive championship jewelry partner of the American Athletic Conference. Cafe Du Monde on a beautiful Saturday here in New Orleans. Boy, I'm getting hungry already. That looks yummy. That's a Sunday morning thing for me, those donuts. We were talking about it being a little brunch with some football action. Well, there is the head man of the South Florida Bulls and Jeff Scott. Second season as head coach. Of course, so much success as the offensive coordinator over at Clemson. We were talking to him this week. Feels like his team is close. They clicked in the second half offensively against Cincinnati last week. Yeah, they've had some really good finishes in the second half. They, they've, they've resorted to throwing the football, which they start off early in the game running the football, and it just seemed, hadn't seemed to work. And Charlie Weiss Jr. told us that you know, and I was even asking him, you know, why not just start with that same philosophy in the beginning of the game is to air it out a little bit more. So it'd be interesting to see what both of these offenses start out with in the beginning of this football game, whether they're going to throw or whether they're going to run the football. Guy was hired as the fifth head coach of South Florida back on December 9th of 2019. Really like year one recruiting wise because of COVID for him last year. Of course, on the other side, Willie Fritz's two lane green wave trying to win here on senior day. 15 seniors getting honored. They have seven super seniors as well. Tulane won the toss, deferred. So they will send it away. This is Casey Glover kicking it off. Dangerous return man for South Florida. Boy, the kickoff goes out of bounds. So they keep it away from Brian Batty, but that's not what you want to do. Pretty good field position to start now for South Florida. Well, considering what he can do with the football, he's had three returns this year for 100-plus yards. I don't know if that's not a bad exchange right there. <laughs> Kick it out of bounds and take your penalty because the alternative would be a lot worse because this guy is deadly back here. The starting quarterback for South Florida, we talked about him in the open, is Timmy McLean, true freshman from Sanford, Florida. Goes by the nickname of Q, middle name Jockwell. His dad's also Timmy, so they wanted to distinguish him somehow. And his offense begins from the 35. 
the give here is to Jaron Mangum, who enters with 15 rushing touchdowns, good for sixth in the FBS and leading the American Athletic Conference. He is a beast on the ground, 6'2", 221. Yeah, he's only three shy of the USF record for a uh, running back, and it's going to be interesting to see. They, they started well the last two games, had really long drives, but have only come away in the last two games with three points on their opening drive. Now there's a completion, and that's Jimmy Horn. He comes in as our second leading receiver, high school teammates over at Seminole, first undefeated state champion in the Orlando area their senior year, and now it brings up third down and short. Yeah, they're a dynamic duo. Third short's where you want to live all day. On the keeper, McLean gets the edge, and he's got a first down. That was something that really worried the defensive coordinator, Chris Hampton, his ability to move and his mobility. Yeah, he's a real threat. He's a true dual threat quarterback. He does really good things with his legs, and their running game was behind this big offensive line that's experienced, and he's one of those guys that can hurt you. Screen pass caught by Omari and Dollison. He's got a gain of about six yards. The Tulane's defense has come on well the last couple of weeks as, as, as well because this offense for Tulane has slowed down. Defense is getting more rest, and so they're fresh when they come onto the football field, playing better, but they're going to have to stifle this opening drive, which all of these plays we're seeing now are scripted right out of the gate. Time to throw for McLean. Shuffles around. This is what he can do, keep plays alive, throws that ball away, and... Learned well from last week when he was picked off by Sauce Gardner in the first half. Of course, one of the best corners in the country, but had a chance in that game early, Brian, to throw a ball away. He did it. He throws that one away. sees another down. Exactly, and that's just about being a young quarterback. You're going to see a lot of man coverage against Tulane. It's what they do. They got away from it earlier in the year. They went more to a zone coverage scheme, but they like to play man, and cover one is what we're seeing right now. They're going to see that all day long, and this UC, these UCF receivers have to be able to get off the press coverage. They've got to be able to win the battle in man coverage because they're going to see it all day long, especially in third and fourth. USF converting just a third of their third downs on the year. There's one. That's Mitchell Brinkman. The tight end muscles his way inside the 30-yard line. Brinkman, a guy who's a returning starter from transfer from Northern Illinois. They kind of make a little mix-up here and drop the tight end in man coverage and a beautiful execution. They go quick again. And a short pickup there for Kelly Joyner. This is a backfield that's very talented for USF. They'll go three deep. Mangum's the power guy. And then you mix it up a little bit. You got Joyner at 5'9", 186. And Brian Batty, we mentioned, returns kicks. He also will run the ball. Yeah, he said it's great to start with Mangum because he falls forward all the time. He's a very physical runner. He gives you those extra yards after contact. Option pitch. Joyner, all kinds of space inside the 15. And he walks in for six. South Florida on the board first. That was awfully easy. 24 yards to the house. Well, Charlie Weiss talked about the two-punch combination with Mangum early, and then he goes later to Joyner, and Joyner's the guy who can take it to the house. And we see that right here. Made it look easy. That opening drive is exactly what they needed. It's what Charlie Weiss Jr. was talking about. Have not had that success over the season, especially the last two weeks. Long drives, but no points. And now they get a nice drive, and they get seven to boot. Eight plays, 65 yards. Extra point is a way in good for Spencer Schrader, who has not missed a kick, PAT, or field goal all year. Good start on the road for the Bulls. They've lost seven straight conference road games. Trying to flip that script today. Great start on the road for South Florida. They march it down eight plays, 65 yards, and a 24-yard touchdown run by Kelly Joyner. So this two-lane team, which has struggled to score points the last couple weeks, will have to respond. Schrader will send it away, and it's a short kickoff that's bobbled initially and then picked up around the 25-yard line by Tulane. And Will Wallace. All right, so here comes this two-lane offense. 
We talked about Michael Pratt, Brian, and the beating that he's taken over the course of the last couple of games. He's thrown a touchdown in 18 of 19 games, but the accuracy has been part of the problem, too. He's only completed about 50% of his passes the last couple outings. Well, the last few games, they've been very, very run heavy on early down, so it's interesting to see they come out throwing the football. And Chip Long talked about how they have tried to slow down this offense. Their tempo is not as great as it used to be. Trying to extend the drives and be able to shorten the football game, but we're seeing a little bit of tempo here early. Six-yard gain to Deuce Watts on first down, and now they run it. And this is Tajay Spears with a crease. Spears has the sideline, and he breaks loose. 20, 10, touchdown Tulane. Green wave are right back in it. What a response from the hometown the team. And Spears, he's a guy who's come on strong lately. He missed our six weeks earlier coming off of a second ACL injury from last year. And the great thing about him is Chip Long told us he doesn't have to call the perfect play with this guy in the ballgame. He can call anything he wants, and he makes things happen, as we just saw there down the boundary for a huge play for Tulane early. Extra point away and good for Merrick Glover, and with that extra point, he is the all-time leading scorer in Tulane history, 334 points. But the story, Tajay Spears, 69 yards, a career-long touchdown. We're off to a fast start here in the Crescent City. A little more than three minutes in, tied at seven. How about this start for two of the bottom three scoring offenses of the AAC? Well, I'm beginning to wonder, is there defense, are there defenses on the field? <laughs> now, granted, we're going to credit these, these coaches for coming out with these first 15 as they script these plays, as they see what's going to work best against these defenses, and they've been effective early. And so we'll see if this continues, but obviously at this pace, there's no telling what that is in number would be on the scoreboard. Kick is away to the always dangerous Brian back tee. He's got three kick return touchdowns he's this got year, it. and he's, he's got, got to it. see him again. Past the 35, past the 40, and a return of 46 yards. You just can't kick the ball to this guy. Well, you can tell that they work hard on their kickoff return and special teams in general because every time he gets the football, there are gaps. And he hits them hard, and he hits them fast. And they're lucky they got him stopped, because that doesn't happen very often. Starting lineups for South Florida, brought to you by Ashley Home Store. We were talking about Mangum at the running back spot. Horn is the high school teammate of the quarterback, Timmy McLean. Brinkman had that catch earlier. And an offensive line, that left side, is really what stirs the drink for this offense. Yeah, they're the group that's, they, they, they're two years they've been together, and they're they great in the run game, great in pass protection. Jet sweep, Omarion Dollison. And it's a gain of about eight yards. And Tulane has been well the last three weeks defensively. They've really played well as a team, offensively and defensively. Their communication's been better. They've had takeaways. They had a period in the, in the season where they had three straight games against ECU, Houston, and SMU, where they didn't have one single turnover. That's just tough. Hand off here to Batty. And he's got a first down on a gain of three. Well, we talked about USF in the backfield, the different guys they can go to. They've got a receiving core with multiple weapons. And look, a rushing offense that only carried it for 101 last week. They're off to a better start. They'll obviously the big run and the touchdown earlier. Yeah, it's nice to have three guys you can depend on, and two of them are guys that can take it to the house quick. McLean to throw over the middle, intercepted. And Tulane with a takeaway. It's Macon Clark out of bounds with a late hit as well. It's Clark's team leading fourth interception, a 34 yard return. And there might be some tacked out of that as well. Well, as head coach talked about having a nose for the football, certainly we see that here. And the 
McLean did not see him in his peripheral vision when he was rolling with his crosser. And he was sitting there basically flat-footed. And he served that one up to him, no problem. That's a DB's dream right there. After the interception, in return, personal foul, face mask, passing team, 15-yard penalty for the run, first down, too late. That's our referee, Edwin Lee. And so you add on the 15 to the 34-yard return. Yeah, that's a no-no. Can't do those. Can't give them yards. Make them work for it. Don't hand it to them, especially after a big turnover like that and field position's already not in your favor. Looks like McLean was the guilty party there, so... Tulane in great position now to take their first lead. Pratt hands off to Spears, tries the left side. He's inside the 20. I like to see that balance. They threw it on the first play of the game. Went to the run now on the second drive. Exactly what they need to do, stay balanced. And injured. Sorry. Be effective on both the run and pass game and keep them guessing, not just early, but all throughout the series as well. Now the injured bowl here is Dwayne Boyles Jr., one of the key linebackers on this defense for USF. 10-31 in the first quarter. Tied at seven here in New Orleans. Tulane trying to cash in off the Macon Clark interception. About four and a half minutes into the first quarter. AAC battle, penultimate game for both Tulane and South Florida. Off to a fast start. Second and five. Again, it's Spears. Had the 69-yard touchdown earlier, a career long. Takes that to the 15-yard line. Jason Vaughn makes the stop. In a place where Tulane wants to be, which is third and short. They haven't been able to do that over the last few weeks, and even during this season, they've been behind the chains most of the time. Manageable distance for them. On the keeper, and it's Pratt getting a first down. And this is what he doesn't get a whole lot of credit for, his legs. His head coach, Willie Fritz, talked about that. He just doesn't get a lot of credit. He's not super fast, super quick, but he's very effective when he does decide to run the football, and he's very good with his decisions on that zone read, as we saw right there. They move Pratt under center, first and goal, Tulane. They fake the sweep and roll Pratt. Looking to throw. It's tipped up and then deflected and caught. Tyreek James. How do you do? Oh, look what I found. Nine-yard touchdown catch. His fourth of the year. And the green wave with 13 unanswered here at home in the first quarter. Looked like he was trying to force it into number three, Fat Watts, coming back across his body, bounces up off the defender's arms, and there's Tyreek James for the easy little, thank you very much, touchdown for the big tight end. You know, it was actually Cameron Carroll. It was 20, not 80. Got a, got a little uh, messed up there, but either way, a touchdown for Tulane. That's his third touchdown catch of the year. And Carroll wasn't even a part of it. He just he just leaked out late when he was looking to block on the, the bootleg and kind of drifted downfield. And next thing you know, there you have it. I'll take that any day of the week. You can't get them any easier than that. Just how they drew it up, right? That's exactly right. Perfect. Chip Long is going to put that one in his playbook. <laughs> no problem. Now, Carroll in his fourth year of college football, redshirt sophomore from Flowood, Mississippi. Mentioned his third TD catch. He actually had two touchdown grabs in the season opener against Oklahoma and Norman. And you think about this Tulane team, boy, that feels like five years ago, that September 4th game where it felt like they were putting the nation on notice and just haven't been able to maintain that kind of offensive execution yeah. since when they dropped 35 in the opener. Yeah, it put huge expectations for them. They were one possession away from winning that game, a five-point loss. But, yeah, it hasn't really played out that way so far. 
This kick goes on the ground and past Horn. Scoops it up and now tries the run and down it goes. And the ball came loose too. Did Tulane hop on and I think USF was able to get in there and recover. And if so, they are awfully lucky. Let's see. They did. Looked like Mitchell Brinkman, their tight end, got in there to grab it. Now, this was just a, just a disaster from the start. Yeah, not wise. It was a funky kick. It came out off his foot really awkward, and it turned out to be a bonus, but not the best kick off of a tee we've seen ever. Kind of worked as a very, very long onside kick, if you will, because it took him a while to get there. It really was covered up almost instantly once he picked the ball up. So this South Florida offense is backed up inside its own 10, and they'll toss it to Mangum. Has a little bit of room to run out past the 10-yard line. And a gain of about four. Mangum's a little bit more of a physical runner and we saw Joyner earlier. He's got a little more size to him, 220-pounder, leading rusher for this football team. McLean will peek back to the sidelines. But they've got to contain number nine behind center. They've got to stay use leverage. Coach Fritz talks about talked about it. Cannot let him slip outside on him. On second and five, that throw behind Horn. Looked like Horn was a little bit shallow on that slant route. He kind of took it a little more inside, flattened it out a little bit, and McLean was planning on him staying a little more vertical, but he was pressed in man coverage. Like I said, they're going to see that all day long, and the throw was just a little bit inside because of that adjustment by Horn on the route. South Florida has converted both of its first, its uh, third downs today. McLean looking to throw and fires high. And out of the reach of his intended target, Yusuf Terry. And so a three and out for South Florida. They'll punt it. But got to give McLean credit. He went through three different receivers before he got to his guy. The only thing he didn't do is he didn't reset his feet. He tried to one-arm it without setting his feet. Ball was off target. No completion. Big three and out for Tulane. Great field position. Andrew Stokes, 27-year-old Australian punter who had never seen a football game, let alone played in one, until their opener at NC State. They'll send it away as a big leg. This is into the wind a bit, and it's off the body of Jaquan Jackson. Now, was he interfered with? Looked like that hit Henry. 33 for USF, I think. It looked like it hit one of the gunners off his leg. Yep, right off his leg. Kick catch interference, number 23, 15 feet, 15-yard penalty, first down. So kick catch interference. Second penalty today for South Florida for 30 yards already. Five possessions, first punt. Didn't expect that. And how about Tulane? A couple of chances to start, what, at the 30 and inside the 20 as well. They've done a really good job on early downs, keeping their third downs manageable. And have really been effective both throwing the football and running it as well. Michael Pratt is two for two so far. He's going deep. Make it three for three. That time it is Tyreek James. That's his fourth touchdown of the season. Michael Pratt is dialed in early. 20 in a row for the green wave here in the first quarter.
Jaquan Jackson, number four, right on the post, right at the middle of the field, wide open as well, and took James along the boundary. He had his pick on that. He had, they had both defenders beat deep. And Pratt just took a choice, made his decision, good throw, good catch, easy conversion, but coverage is not that tight. Got caught in the play action. Got to have some eye discipline in that secondary. Cannot get sucked in, but a great job by Tulane of selling the run, running the ball early successfully, keeping those defenders honest, and got a beat right on the backside. Now, on a play like that defensively for USF, is that all on one guy? Are there multiple breakdowns going on? No, that's all on one or two guys. That's man coverage, and they're getting stuck. Or even if even if it wasn't, if it's zone coverage and their eyes get stuck, they're letting everybody deep. The safety should never have anybody deeper than him. And when you see a safety that shallow, that's just a poor job. And we've talked about this with their off defensive coordinator, Glenn Spencer. They're just very thin in the secondary. He said in games past they do 100 100 plays on him, and by the time they got to 70, they were done. And they're giving up big play after big play. We've seen it earlier against Tulane. Big play after big play, and they just look like they're really struggling defensively, especially in that secondary where they're so thin. Batte inside his five, and pulled down again, shy of the 20. A lot of tussling going on here. I mean, he's got the ball here. And... A little extracurricular. Yep. A little, little more work. Obviously, Willie's going <laughs> to get in his face and tell him about controlling his emotions. Emotions are great, but you want it to work in your favor, not against you. Well, slow starts have been a problem for the Green Wave. 14 points combined last couple of first quarters and 45 for the season, so... 21 points already for them. McLean and USF now back to work, down by 14. And they run it again with Mangum. Couple yards, inside eight to go in this fast moving first quarter. See what Charlie Weiss Jr. in this offense can dial up. Option read. Nice play defensively there from the two lane fronts. Nick Anderson and Noah Sided. Did a really good job on the same play earlier to the opposite side for the touchdown, but Tulane has done some adjustments and McLean decides to keep it. Big hit, a little third down and long here, which is where you don't want to live, especially with a freshman quarterback. Even though he's got a few games under his belt, it's just a hard place for any offense to be able to convert. On third and six, Tulane rushes four. McLean to the edge. And with his feet, he's got the first down. And I had talked to their defensive coordinator, Chris Hampton, for Tulane about containing number nine. I said, when you're gonna run man coverage, You've only got one safety deep, you can spy him. And we see, we see big number 46, Dorsus out there trying to run with him, but he just can't and have the speed. And that's what he said. He said, when you do spy him, you have to have a guy out there who can stop him. He said, it's one thing to do it to have a spy, but he has to be able to stop the run, which we're not effective on that play, obviously. Another read option keep. Nice tackling space by Eric Hicks. Three yard gain. So you're saying Dorsus at six foot two sixty five isn't quite mobile enough? <laughs> he didn't have enough in the tank. <laughs> he was trying hard, but just couldn't get there. But they've got to use leverage. Willie Fritz talked about that. Got to keep everything on that inside shoulder, especially with McLean when he pulls that ball down. It's just so effective. That's why the dual threat quarterback is such a vital force in college football today. On second and seven, this is Joiner. A nice cut. He's up near the 45. He's close to another first down. And they will indeed move it forward. They got just enough to gain a seven. Well, that's a really good job of that two-lane defense against that big 
offensive line, very experienced crew. We talked about them earlier. They're going to be the difference in this game for South Florida. Joiner again, right up the gut, pulled down by Jeffrey Johnson, making his 43rd start today, most on the defense for the Green Wave. And we see a little bit of a shift by Charlie Weiss Jr. after that INT. What have we seen? The ball is on the ground. That's where he's keeping it. And it makes you giddy as a, as a, as a coordinator and as a, as, a, as a quarterback. When you have an INT, it rattles you. So he's sticking with the run game, which is what they do best, especially with that big front five. McLean, down he goes. Johnson drills him. Some initial pressure from Jaden Kennedy, the true freshman from Jacksonville. Only true freshman starter on this team had the initial pressure. Yeah, he really wants that one back. McLean does. He should have given it. He decided to pull it, thinking he could get the edge. If he gives that football, they might have had a first down easy. First sack of the year for Johnson. Third and long again for USF. Three for four today on third down. Inside five to go, first quarter. McLean steps up, fires deep, and off the fingertips of his high school teammate, Jimmy Horn. Well, he had Horn earlier. Horn was in the slot to the far side, and he went to look for him. He didn't make the throw. Steps up in the pocket. He still has it, but just doesn't good do a good job of on-the-move passing. Just a little bit high and inside, anywhere outside, he would have given him a chance. Another one, two plays in a row that Horn wish he had back. The handoff in the middle on the zone read, and that pass right there, which could have been an easy conversion for a first down and extended that South Florida drive. Andrew Stokes to punt again. Jaquan Jackson gets under it, and he's got a return of maybe a yard. Good job and covers there by the USF punt team. And Tulane will go back to work. This time, not quite the field position we've seen them have in this first quarter. Well, guess what? They're three for three scoring touchdowns. So I'm going to take the percentages and say that, you know what? South Florida's got to step up here. We talked about it. They're very thin in that linebacker core and his, that defensive back group. So it'll be interesting to see how Tulane comes out and opens this drive. They've been very balanced early, running and passing the football equally as much on first down. Brat to the air. And he's got a completion out to the edge. Jatavian Tolds, gain of five. Willie Fritz talked about wanting to throw the football more. They needed to throw the football more. They've been doing that very effectively, even in early downs, getting them in manageable distances. Brown again over the middle and held on to. Breaking free, Shea Wyatt inside the 30. And this passing game starting to get rolling for Michael Pratt. He hasn't missed yet today, Brian. He's now five for five. And now his 89 yards passing. Well, point number 22, the free safety is just a little bit late getting there. And misses the tackle, which you cannot do. Spears tries the left side. He's pulled down by the very talented Antonio Greer. He's the leader on this defense. Fourth year junior from Atlanta, second team all conference. Two yeah, season to go. He leads the team in everything. Interceptions as well. Quarterback hurries, sacks, tackles for loss. Tackles last week, tackles for the season. This guy is the alpha male of that South Florida defense for sure. Inside three to go, opening quarter. Tulane looking for more, up by 14. Jet sweep, Dollison. I should say, beg your pardon, Jaquan Jackson. And he's got enough for a first down. Jackson's their third leading receiver. But the best way to make a completion is to hand it off right in front of you. I don't know if they're going to put that as a, as a pass, but technically it was a forward pass to Jaquan Jackson around the edge on the speed sweep. But South Florida just doesn't seem to have an answer for Tulane. And whatever Tulane is dialing up, Chip Long, their offensive coordinator, this is getting too easy. 
Better job there in the run contained. Big Kevin Kengler, 6'2", 303. Grad student out of Madison, Florida, makes the stop. So what do you have to do here for USF defensively? What adjustment has to be made? They just got to be more aware of the, foot, the football. That play action got them earlier on that deep ball. But they've got to just do their jobs. They've got to be effective in taking care of what's in front of them and not concerning themselves with anything else. Spears and the Wildcat. So a little wrinkle there from Tulane and Chip Long. He gets it inside the 15. Yeah, I haven't seen much of that. But this puts them in third and long in the red zone. Obviously, the windows get smaller. You've got to be effective running the football. But South Florida has been better. Their front four, their, those, those front three guys they have up there, big, strong guys who do a really good job shutting down that run game. And so Pratt's going to have to find a window here. Inside 90 seconds, first quarter. Pratt, another completion. And breaking a tackle is Fat Watts. He's got a first down. The Green Wave have first and goal, gain of seven yards. Well, what opens up windows in the red zone or anywhere else is play action, and they've been very effective at it. They use it right there. Obviously, the flat route, an easy throw. The defender's trailing, can't get out there quick enough, and then misses the tackle. You just cannot allow that to happen for extra yards and get the first down and convert as three points now it might turn into six because of that one missed tackle. Wildcat on first and goal with Spears right up the gut, muscling into the end zone. His second touchdown run today. This one from six yards out and an offensive explosion for the Green Wave here in the first quarter. I guess I was right. I took the percentages at 100%, and guess what? They're holding up four for four with possessions versus and equaling touchdowns, and Spears obviously a huge element to that with that first touchdown he had for 69 yards, and then following it up there. Beautiful execution. Merrick Glover now. Extra point is away and through. He's four for four today. He's made 78 straight. Another look at the touchdown run. Just right up the middle, the heart of that South Florida defense. Just got through talking about that front seven. And then they allow him to go right up the middle and just gash him. That's demoralizing for a defense. It's very frustrating. And I know Glenn Spencer, we talked to him the other day. He seemed frustrated because he has such injuries and he's so thin in that secondary and it's got to be frustrating for him because he's got to come up with an answer. He's got to figure out a way to stop him. We talked about bringing pressure and passing downs, but Tulane hasn't had any. They've been staying ahead of the chains and converting. They haven't had to worry about third and medium, third and long. They've been staying out of that, being effective, moving the football on the ground. And Chip Long, the offensive coordinator for Tulane, has got to be there. It cannot be this easy. Where has this been all year? Where has this been all year for this Tulane Green Wave offense? You think about it, 13 points and an overtime loss last week. Just a gut-wrenching loss against Tulsa and only 10 points against UCF, 12 against Cincinnati. And boy, they're nearly to the total of those three games in this first quarter. In their first four possessions of the game. And who would have thought that? I certainly wouldn't me. I did not think that would happen. No, Batty can change a game in one play. See what he can do here. Coverage has been pretty good so far from the Green Wave. Twenty-yard return. The stop from Shaquem Leister for Tulane. What are you thinking about now? If you're this USF offense, you're in a hole of 21 points already now. They were there last week against Cincinnati. They were down big early, fought back in the second half. What are you trying to dial up? Well, I talked to Charlie Weiss Jr. about it. I said their best offense the team has is the one that has nothing to lose. Well, guess what? They're pretty much there already. They got nothing to lose. They need to open up this offense. Well, they, they had it right there as we <laughs> talked about it. And just one missed assignment, which is the biggest one on the play, which is to catch the football. And just got short-armed right there. He really had nothing threatening him except for the safety inside. And Atkins, just a stone-cold drop, which 
got to be frustrating for everyone involved in that program right now, especially offensively. Five straight incompletions for McClay, and that streak ends here. Brinkman with a gain of about eight yards. Well, you want to give your, your quarterback confidence, right? You go to the tight end, and you go short to the tight end. That's exactly what they did right there and got him in a manageable distance, which they haven't had in a while. Flag pre-snap. False start for the offense. All players are not set before the snap. Five-drug penalty, third down. You know it's not good when a number doesn't even get names. It's just everybody. Everybody. That's not good. Well, offside, that's a, that's a silly penalty. You just cannot allow that, especially third and short. Now you're making it a, almost a very difficult situation for them in third and eight. End of the first quarter here in New Orleans. Timmy McLean acted like he didn't know it. And USF has a little soul searching to do. Got off to such a good start. That touchdown run early from Joyner. All two lanes since. 28 points to finish off the first for the Green Wave. Up big at home. Tulane, 28 straight points to finish off that first quarter as we begin the second. They had scored 45 first quarter points entering today. 31 of them came in their first two games against Oklahoma and Morgan State. So apparently my partner, Ryan Kinchin, is the answer here. You show up and their first quarter offense comes alive. I'm telling you, it's been unbelievable. It's been fun to watch. McLean and USF to work. And that's a nice pass to Jimmy Horn along the sideline. Pushed out of bounds by a Johnny Kerr. I think it's a great story how they got him over here when they were looking at McLean as him and his dad told him about Horn. And they were like, yeah, fast wide receiver from Florida. Yeah, we heard the story. But then they saw him on tape. They offered him. And then the next day, so did Georgia and Ole Miss. And they were lucky to get him. He's a, he's a dynamic player. And him along with McLean makes a deadly weapon in a partnership. Another toss sweep. And Dollison has the edge. He's their fastest guy. Only player with a reception in every game this year for USF. Gain of six yards there. Yeah, you know, you mentioned the dynamic between the two of them. You think about McLean coming here. They didn't actually watch him in person because of COVID. I think about the recruiting process. It was all watching him on tape, Zoom yeah. calls, phone calls. That took some trust for him to put his faith in Jeff Scott and his coaching staff. Mangum on the ground. He's got a first down. It really did, and then when the coaches saw him in the spring of this of this year, they said they, they realized that this guy can, is our future at quarterback, and it was a pleasant surprise for them. And obviously the talent that he has, that he's brought to this offense, hadn't been able to pull out the Ws, and obviously a learning curve is in, in effect. And his offensive coordinator, Charlie Weiss Jr., said he hit a freshman wall a few games into the season, but he's come back strong after the injury, after missing the ECU game. Option read, another high throw. That's incomplete for Demarcus Gregory. Couple balls have sailed on him early in this first half. And that's just an accuracy thing, but we look at what happened there. He's sitting off back on him. Well, with him being a left-footed or left-handed passer, is sitting back on his left foot and not getting through to his right foot. And when you have a rusher in your face, that's just that's just a natural thing. But you've got to be able to have that presence, that sixth sense, which his offensive quarter said that he does have. But obviously, we haven't seen a lot of that here today. He's been ineffective being able to throw the football, and accuracy has been the big issue. On second and 10, Mangum picks his way to the 45. Gain of a couple, and another third down and long upcoming. Nick Anderson makes the stop. Talented player for this two-lane defense. We really haven't seen a ball down the middle of the field since that interception. And I don't know if it's if that's Charlie Weiss's in it, or no, lack of desire to do that, or if that's McLean just a little bit shell-shocked from that bad throw. He, well, not really a bad throw, but he just didn't see the defender on that on the opposite side. Looking for Horn in the slot to the top side. Pressure coming, down he goes. And that's what Tulane can do. 
they have that secondary where they can put in man coverage out there and they can bring as much pressure as they want right up the middle, which is surprising. This is the most experienced part of this South Florida football team is their offensive line, and they just got manhandled right there by Tulane. Nick Anderson has a sack now in four consecutive games. What a start here for the junior from Vicksburg, Mississippi. Yeah, everybody loves him. He works hard in practice. It shows up in the games, and he's a great communicator, the one who gets everybody in the right position on that defense. He's a smart guy. He wants to be an FBI agent, which I don't really think that I would ever want to be an FBI agent. <laughs> Or around one even. Early in the second quarter, Green Wave up big. A final home game for the Green Wave here in 2021. They've brought out the big guns. How about the burrito cannon? I know, but it doesn't seem to reach to the press box. Come on, guys. Got to get some more power in that thing. <laughs> one right here, right in the old miss. We're ready. Now, this Green Wave offense is in high gear early in this game. They've had the ball four times. They've scored four touchdowns. They've, Michael Pratt has not missed. They've thrown the ball three of their four times in their opening series. And right on cue, his first incompletion. Here we go. Why wouldn't you? Everything else has worked, right? Well, there are the numbers. Nearly 14 per play so far. And the funny thing is, they're balanced. They're 101 pass and 107 run. How balanced can you get in that? On second down, a cut from Spears. Not a whole lot doing. And the South Florida defense needs a stop in the worst way. Again, 28 straight points for just joining us for Tulane after South Florida struck first. Both of these teams trying to stop some lengthy streaks. Two lanes lost eight straight. South Florida's lost 10 straight road games, seven straight conference road games. They got to get off the field here. They do. On third and eight, they bring pressure. Pratt to the sideline has another completion. It is Deuce Watts. He is good for 10 and a first down. That's a beautiful throw, and we talked about pressure with their defensive coordinator, Glenn Spencer. He said he just didn't know they were so thin in the secondary. He said it's a huge risk. But in that situation where they have so much yards to get, it was a nice call. But Pratt did a very good job of getting it out to watch with a conversion. Again to throw on first down. And it looked like Fat Watts didn't have his head turned around. Closest first to that ball was the safety out in coverage, Vincent Davis. You had no one. Good man coverage in the secondary by South Florida. And Pratt had some time, but he had nowhere to go with the football. You'll take one or the other. You either you're take that sack or you got everybody covered, and eventually he's got to do something else with it. Screen pass caught by Tolls. He has some moves. And he's got a gain of seven, making eight yards. Their senior, second leading receiver on the team, and we see how elusive he is out in space, and finally getting him down, but a couple of missed tackles, and something that South Florida has struggled with over the last few weeks for sure is tackling the ball carry. Fifth year senior from Houston having a career year. Green wave motion, a couple of tight ends, and a run here for Pratt, and he's got a first down. Haven't seen them running him a ton these last couple games. Of course, we've talked about how beaten up he's been, so trying to save him any way they can. You know, there have been practices where he doesn't even throw the ball, and he'll go a week without throwing just to kind of save his arm. Off play action. Pratt pumps, now looks deep for Tolls. He's got him. Cuts it back at the 15 and into the end zone. Touchdown Tulane. 52 yards, Jatavian Tolls, and 34 straight for the Green Wave. He had him right over the top, and he even waited on him. And the safety, LaPointe, number 22, you see him right there. Just can't make a play on the ball, kind of loses his footing. And nice conversion, and 
T.J. Robinson, the cornerback, they only have three really healthy cornerbacks in that secondary that they rotate in and out. But that's not a lot. Everybody behind them is freshmen and sophomore, the sophomores. But, again, Tulane, five possessions, five touchdowns. Who would have thought? Awfully impressive for any team. An offense that came in trying to find itself. They have found itself in this first half. Tolls to the house. Tulane rolling at home. Beautiful Saturday in the Crescent City. And the hometown Tulane Green Wave have woken up on offense. 35 first half points. We've still got 9.57 to go. They had scored, Brian, 35 points in their previous three games combined. Not something was on our list of thinking could happen, but they have a world-class punter waiting in the wings for fourth down, but guess what? They haven't had one. They haven't had to even convert one. They've been that effective offensively. A little bit of a squibber here. and Picked up by Brinkman. He'll take it to about the 35. Yeah, they're not going to put it back there in Batty's hands and see if he can continue in his touchdown streak of he has three already with for 100 yards which is unbelievable so squib there yardage is good you're gonna continue the trend as we've seen being able to stop him after that first possession ashley home store starting lineup these two lane defense we've called a bunch of these guys today macon clark in the back end had the interception earlier nick anderson in the linebacking core leads that group a defense that has certainly played better the last few weeks, only allowed 13 in regulation in Tulsa last week. And since the opening drive, they've been dialed in. See what McLean and USF can get going. This is Chris Carter, the backup tight end, across the 40-yard line on a gain of six. And that's not the first time we've seen that play, but it is effective. It does get it to the tight end. It gives the quarterback some movement. Gets them in their short distances, especially in second and four, manageable distances. Joiner. Feels like forever ago that he opened the game with a 24-yard touchdown run. Holding the turf by Adonis Freelou. And USF, who are four for seven on third down, but started three for four, Brian, with a big one here, third and two. That's Joiner. Bounces outside, he's got a first down. Yeah, the shorter the third downs, the easier the conversion. They should really categorize them as third and long and third and short, because when you give those overall third down percentages, some of those guys are unbelievably long, eight, 10, 12 yard conversions just aren't possible. But those third ones, we'll take them all day long. And I'm sure Charlie Weiss Jr. is just thankful that he gets another set of fresh downs. From the 47. McLean going deep and out of the reach of his target, Demarcus Gregory. You know, one thing worth noting, Xavier Weaver, their leading receiver coming in, we haven't seen him today. He's been banged up with a hamstring the last couple of weeks. And they said they were going to look at him in pre-season and pre-game and see how he felt, and it doesn't look like he's going to be on the field today. He had, the, he had Horn on the crossing route over the top, but he decided to go for the big ball. Even though I think if he had gone to Horn, they'd have made a lot of yardage on that play, but he decided to gamble and go deep. Horn motions to the bottom of your screen, and off the backside, a huge hit delivered by Darius Hodges. Oh, he just throws him back at the 41. Sack number five on the year for the redshirt freshman from Montgomery, Alabama. Frustration for McLean because you... With the right-handed quarterback, it's the left tackle on the left side that needs to be protecting his backside. But when you're a left-handed quarterback, that right side, that right side of that offensive line has to protect his backside, which they didn't do. We saw some frustration from him getting out of the turf. Third and 16, they just kind of lofted out to the edge. A couple of nice spin moves there from back T. And now you're in a position here for UCF where at least you can think about going for it. No, I think they will. They're going for it. There's no question. They, they, have, they have nothing to lose, as I said earlier. Their offense is pulling out all the stops now. We 
talked to them about fourth down this year, how it's kind of reigned over the landscape of college football and even crept into the NFL of how you deal with it. And I asked defensive coordinators, both of them, about it. And they said, you know what, you just expect it. You expect it in situations where they might go, you expect them to go, and if they don't, that's a good thing. It's not like old days where you never expected them to actually go for it, but they do now all, all the time. All kinds of movement here before the snap. And we saw that earlier on a very similar third and short as opposed to the fourth and short. Ball start, number 73. Now the punt team's coming onto the field. Five yard penalty, fourth down. Makes that decision a little easier now. Everybody but the center. Yep, ball just wasn't snapped. They give it to Donovan Jennings, but there were three or four guilty parties there. Now, the busiest man for USF in this first half has been their 27-year-old Australian rookie punter, Andrew Stokes. He'll send away another one to Jaquan Jackson. And end over end punts that will take a soft bounce and hit right around the 12. Thirty-five-seven, all green wave. Midway through the second quarter. Thirty-five-seven, the lead for Tulane over South Florida. Starting to get late in this first half. Michael Pratt and this green wave offense have been clicking in high gear from the get-go. Pratt nine for 11, 167 through the air, and has tied a career high already with three touchdown passes. 35 unanswered points for the Green Wave. And they run it with Spears. They really do like their tight ends. I talked to Chip Long and he said, these guys are getting a lot more reps than they've ever got since they've been here. And James, who's a junior, and Wallace and Redshirt Jr., they're always on the field, regardless of what down and distance it is. Pratt to throw again, and another completion, this time to Shea Wyatt. So he's now 10 for 12, 11 more yards there. And boy, this is about the best we've seen Michael Pratt look in his career. They've been having problems with the protection, and Pratt has really been locking on to receivers the last, well, that was not the last couple of weeks, but before that, really just missing throws. He missed some throws last week in the game that could have could have won the ball game in that when they had that tie ball game. But he has to be because his protection has been so poor this year. And now we're seeing him getting the ball out a lot quicker, which is huge for protection without a doubt. Gets it out quick again to Wyatt. Better job of tackling that time. Daquan Evans makes the stop. And they talked about their receivers having trouble all year against press coverage, but we just don't see that against this South Florida, Florida football team. They don't have the, the personnel, the healthy personnel, to be able to do that. So they're getting a lot more soft coverage, which makes it easier on those receivers. Long screen pass caught. And across the 40-yard line goes Jaquan Jackson. You know, Pratt not only is on target here, Brian, but he's spreading the wealth. Different guys are getting involved. He's definitely lo not locked on, and he's got really his pick of the litter. As we saw in that touchdown pass, I was talking about how he had the crosser wide open, but he decided to go to James. He's got multiple targets that are running down the field, not covered. Jackson, the seventh different receiver to make a catch. Fat Watts with another grab. He's to midfield. And about a yard shy of a first down, gain of nine. Well, I keep going back to that statement by Willie Fritz. We need to throw the ball more and stay balanced. Well, they have done that, and they have looked like they're just going to decide to put the ball in the air and say, stop us, South Florida, because you haven't done it yet. Double reverse and a flea flicker into a pass. And wide open, Will Wallace with a diving grab. Chip Long is digging deep into the playbook today. A gain of 31 and some magic for the Green Wave. A little trickeration and the tight end turns his hips. 
really takes that one as a hard one because Crack put it a little bit on the outside. But just a good job of coming down with the football. Give this time is to Carroll. He's up the gut for about three yards. They're having fun out here. There's no question. They are. They, they, it's, it's been a while since we've seen them be able to perform like this. And when you do, how can you not have fun? You work your tail off all week, all year, trying to get plays to work as they should. And the, for drives to end up with touchdowns. And they've had all that success here today. And this is what makes it worthwhile, the hard work. Seeing it pay off is just, a, it's, it's, as a player, even though you're sucking wind out there and you can't feel your legs because they're so tired, you're at least having fun knowing you're scoring points. Again, Tulane has lost eight straight coming in. South Florida has dropped seven straight conference road games. Pratt off play action, dumps it off to Carroll, who ran into his own guy and ran into Daquan Evans, sophomore from Orlando. Carroll's down in some pain. Don't ever like to see that. He's just doing his job. Evans making the play. He's not being dirty, just going low. That's what you do. Corners do that. Corners don't like to go up high. Less physicality for the corners to make a tackle, the better, and that's what they do. But you hate to see anybody limping off of the field, especially the redshirt sophomore Carroll, who's been such a huge element to this offense. So Carroll goes off, and it's now a third down and nine. And off to Spears. And up to the 15-yard line. Well, here's fourth down, but you're up by 28 points, so the field goal unit will indeed come out, even though it doesn't happen very often these days in college football. Normally, when you would see that play on third down and the game was tight, you would think, okay, they're running that play because they know they're going to run a fourth down. But obviously, Tulane in that long yardage situation was just going to not take any chances. Took the run up the middle, give them some yards for their kicker to have a little bit of a shorter kick. And the last kick he had, if you remember last week, was not a very memorable one for him, and I'm sure that he'd like to forget, which would have won the football game in regulation against Tulsa. Timeout taken by Tulane. 2.12 to go in the first half, up by 28 points. So a chance for redemption here late in the second quarter for Merrick Glover. Missed from 26, could have won the game against Tulsa last week on his senior day, sixth year here at Tulane from Jericho, New York. This from 32 yards has been so steady in his career. This will put him over the all-time scoring leader in Tulane history with this kick. A little bit of a low snap, and the kick is no good. Well, I take that back because of the extra points he's already got. Knocked in the uh, first extra point earlier, actually, to break the record. Well, he, you know, that game last week, he shoved it a hair right, and guess what? This one went the other way. It's amazing how that gets into the head of a kicker. Kind of like a golf swing. Once you hang one right, guess what? The next one's probably going to left. <laughs> Unless you're me, and when the slice is on, <laughs> the slice true. is staying on. That's true. <laughs> That's true. Yeah, the slice-duck hook combo is not a good one. Yes. So first drive without points scored. Wow. Yeah, six took them six drives. Who would have thought? Yes. Well, South Florida really needs something here. They don't get the ball to start the third. So what can Timmy McLean stir up? Pressure coming again, and this two-lane pass rush is getting home and getting there often. Jeffrey Johnson has a second sack today. There's just not much else you can do. You're, you're, you're standing behind your the strongest position on your team, this big front five offensive line, and they're not even bringing pressure and getting to it. Thank you. Third sack of the game for the Green Wave defense. McLean moving around in his own end zone. 
Fires sideline toward Horn, and they'll say he was bobbling out of bounds. It was a good job of keeping it alive, and after the last play, what else is he supposed to think? They're only bringing four, but yet they did on the, first, the previous play, and they stacked him, so he gets a little jittery, starts moving around the pocket. And really, if you couldn't, have, if you could have got anything out of that, it would have made it a more manageable situation than this third and forever. Third and 19, they run it with Joyner trying to break one. Works to the sideline, and he's got a first down. He got it by a yard. He needed 19. He got 20. That's a huge play for USF to move the chains late in the first half. We've solved the riddle. What do you call him third and 19? Right up the middle of the defense. Just the inside handoff. The last thing they thought they would see, and then they convert. So you know Charlie Weiss Jr.'s got to be going, thank you very much. New set of downs. There's life. Joyner's been the one guy giving them offense today. 66 rush yards now in that one touchdown. McLean rolling again across his body, bobbled and incomplete, looking for Atkins. So they he's had, had a couple targets, no catches. They had everyone covered. The only guy that was running free was on the opposite side of the field, about 50 yards away from McLean, and there was no way he was getting that football there. But Tulane is just a very effective man coverage defense. And if you cannot beat them off the ball and, they, and create separation, your quarterback's going to have a long day. And we've seen that play out here in the first half. McLean, 9 for 19, has been sacked three times, delivers a strike here to Gregory. He sat back in zone and gave the open underneath bow right into the little deep hook curl route. McLean needed that. Hadn't had a whole lot of success moving the ball down the middle of the field with his arm. 19-yard gain. They've got all three timeouts. McLean, time to throw. Now he rolls. Again, no one downfield. And a good job of extending and getting the ball out to Dollison. Second-year freshman out of Columbia, South Carolina. Third leading receiver coming in. Gain of eight. It's amazing how nowadays we got to specify second year, third year freshman. Second down and short. It's Joyner again. Couple of cuts. And I think he spun just enough with that last burst for a first down. He did get it. Now this is just what the doctor ordered for USF here before the half. Yeah, there's not a lot of time left, and they're playing a little bit more all out than they would normally. But in the situation they're in, they're going to have to do that for the rest of the game to be able to make up ground against Tulane because with the exception of the missed field goal, we haven't seen them stop this Tulane offense. Well, remember, they got down 31-7 to early in the third against Cincinnati last week. And it came back to make it a 10-point game on multiple occasions. And we were talking to Charlie Weiss about it. You know, he was talking to us about the RPO versus the PRO, right? The run pass option versus the pass run option. And he just said, look, I let Timmy McLean make choices and let it fly in that second half. And he wanted to do that more going in today. It kind of just felt like they started out this game tight. Yeah, and he emphasized that the last two games. They ran the ball early and with no success and success in the second half. And they seem to be doing the same thing and trying to run the football. Now they're throwing it a little bit more, giving him a little bit more freedom, and they're having a little bit more success here late. From the 40, Gregory is pulled down. Another tackle for Nick Anderson. He's racking him up in this first half. That's his fourth. And the second South Florida timeout. Not much time to work with, and when you complete a ball short of the first down inside the boundaries, you're going to have to burn timeouts. It's tough when you don't have an offense that's been, been successful all half long, and all of a sudden you've got to go 80 in less than a minute. It's a little bit of a tough predicament for this offense, and offensive coordinator Charlie Weiss Jr. being able to pull this off. If they get any points out of this, it'll be a bonus because they'll get the ball in the second half. They need some type of momentum. And moving the football is great, 
but it doesn't really make you feel rewarded unless you get points on the board. Second down and seven. Inside 30 seconds left. That ball tipped at the line of scrimmage. A lot of guys have stepped up and made plays for this defense today. That's Adonis Freelu. He's a guy who's come on in his first sack of the season in the second quarter last week against Tulsa. Another redshirt freshman who's making an impact. This is all you have when you're getting double teamed. You got no other choice to find the quarterback, try to bat down the ball, and he did what he only only thing he could do. He's not gonna beat double coverage and pass rush. USF needs seven. McLean with pressure again, steps through two, looks, runs, and he is finally pulled down as he crosses the 35. USF's going to have to use its last time out. So a lot of running there to get three yards. I, un I understand the four-yard game, but maybe you're better there saving some clock and having to deal with that seven yards to go situation on fourth down. exactly right, and credit to Tulane. They're just, they've got everything locked down. They know what they're going to do. They're going to throw the football, and they've got somebody running with every receiver, and they've got it covered deep. He has no choice. He has nowhere else to go with the football. What's impressed you most about this Tulane defense today? I just think just being effective of containing McLean, they've just done a really good job of that, and they shut down the run game after that first series. It's kind of like last week against Tulsa. They got run over a little bit, and then they stepped up their game just like they did a week ago. Now, Spencer Schrader is going to try one here from 51 yards. His career long is 52. He'll get a practice attempt in. It's too late to call the timeout. It hit the upright. Yeah, we could debate about that as well. Why wait so <laughs> long and give him a free run? Give him a free kick. But then again, he does that, it goes into his head. And, you know, he's thinking, well, maybe right. maybe the next one I need to <laughs> pull it just a hair. And next thing you know, it misses left. He hit the top part of it. He had plenty of legs, yeah. just a little bit to the right. You know, I've always wondered. Now, no one stands... 15, 20 feet tall yet in human history, but you know in basketball they shoot a three after the buzzer and you knock the ball away? What about a designated high leaper back there to knock the field goal away? Go. <laughs> Put him on a ladder that's or a, something. That's a, that's a thought, you never know. <laughs> but I just, I think that, you know, when, when you, uh, I think not calling a timeout would be better because they're expecting it. That's almost a, a reverse effect. From 51 yards on the way, and no good. To the left, he missed it. First attempt was much better. And still five seconds to go now, so if the green wave won, maybe you can throw a Hail Mary. I don't think they will, but we shall see. Yeah, I don't know why you would take that risk. But that's why I'm up in the booth and not down on the field <laughs> making calls. <laughs> the Schrader's got an NFL leg, according to his head coach, Jeff Scott. We saw that on that first kick. Lou Groza awards semifinalist for the top kicker in the country. That was actually his first miss of the season. He had been perfect nine for nine, one of six kickers in the FBS, with at least nine attempts, who hadn't missed coming in. Michael Pratt will drop to a knee. And a dominant first half for the Tulane Green Wave comes to a close, 35 to seven. 35 unanswered points after that opening touchdown from Joyner. I can't ask for much more from your team if you're Willie Fritz. I can't say you do. You missed the one field goal on the last possession, and that was it. Otherwise, you're putting up six on every drive. I don't know how you cannot be happy. But then again, head coaches, you never know what they're thinking. And we've got Tulane head coach Willie Fritz with us now. Coach, a great first half from your group. Five touchdowns on your first five drives. What'd you like most offensively? Well, you know, we're doing a good job throwing and uh, uh, running. We're, you know, passing the ball effectively, had some good protection, and we're running the ball real well, too. Hey, Coach, let me ask you this. What is more in your head right now? Are you happy for the success of your football team, or is it that you're concerned about maybe some complacency in the second half? We got to finish. There you go. Thanks for your time, Coach. Appreciate Thank it. Thank you, Coach. Well, there you go. That's been the message all season long with this two-lane team finishing ball games, up 28, comfortable margin.
but they'll have to finish it. A huge first half for Michael Pratt. Three touchdown passes, 35 points on the board for the Green Wave. Up four scores at halftime here at home. Whole bunch of happy fans here at Yulman Stadium in New Orleans. 35-7 the lead for Tulane over South Florida in their final home game on Senior Day. Let's take a look now at the top plays of the week from around the American Conference. Welcome into the American Athletic Conference studios. I'm Morgan Uber. It's officially the fall crossover season here in the American. And man, does it show in our top plays of the week. We've got football, volleyball, basketball, and soccer all for you in this show. But first, we start on the gridiron at number six, Cincinnati at South Florida. Bearcats quarterback Desmond Ritter. He's looking for wide receiver Alex Pierce, but he is denied by the defensive back Christian Williams. Williams takes off, returning it 61 yards to set up the Bulls in the red zone. Cincinnati goes on to take care of business, though, 45-28. We've got more football for you at number five. It's Tulsa at Tulane. On third down, Tulsa quarterback Davis Brin looking for the end zone, but it's 1v2 right here. Jaden Kennedy flies through the air. We're going to take another look at this diving interception. The Green Wave took Tulsa to overtime, but dropped this one 20 to 13. Hoops make its debut in our top plays. Number 12, Memphis. Imani Bates for a corner three, but it's a putback dunk by Josh Minot. Are you kidding me, Josh Minot? Watch this one again. Minot rose to the occasion and helped the Tigers roll over NC Central. Coming in at number three. Watch number 15, Morgan Stout for Wichita State Volleyball. Right there in the middle. She makes a kick save for the Shockers. We're going to get a closer look at this. And this may be completely shocking, everyone. But yes, this is a legal play here in volleyball. Wichita State ends up winning in five sets. Coming in at number two, from a kick on the court to a kick on the pitch, American men's soccer semifinal action. Luca Dorado with a nice pass to set up Heiner De Jesus for the goal. And watch this follow through celebration. It doesn't get better than that. A spectacular goal followed up by a spectacular round off layout by De Jesus. And finally, at at number one, Jacksonville State at Wichita State. It's a tied game, time ticking, no timeout called. It's Tyson Etienne with the ball. A logo three, and it is good. Etienne, pure swagger with the casual walk-off. He called game, and the Shockers won 60-57. If you see a top play happen live, you can tweet at me, at Morgan underscore Uber, or at the American, at American underscore comp. We're going to get you right back out to second half action right after this. Well, a great week of action around the American and all kinds of sports going on. Crossover season officially here in New Orleans. Big lead for the Green Wave. More halftime after this. Tulane up big at halftime on USF. And, uh, you know, Stephen Martin broke the color barrier in the SEC playing his first Tulane game in baseball back in 1965. We've got a great feature for you on the 2021 recipients of the Stephen Martin Scholars. Stephen Martin broke the color barrier in the SEC in 1965 when he played baseball for Tulane uh, against Spring Hill College. Um, he paved the way for um, athletes of color, including myself, to play our collegiate athletics in the South. We started this award in 2019. Uh, we recognized that Stephen Martin was really a pioneer, uh, and we wanted to honor his legacy and ensure that uh, all the folks that came after him understood um, the sacrifices that he uh, made and, and contributions that he made. 
Both Sierra and Sincere are incredible individuals. They are both uh, on the Student Athlete Advisory Committee. They've assumed leadership roles on their individual teams, uh, been voted as team captains. Uh, they're very civic-minded. I'm always so amazed at what Sierra has been able to accomplish at Tulane in her time here. Uh, not only on the court being a leader, uh, but three-time ambassador winner, uh, what she's done in neuroscience in, in the Tulane community and New Orleans community. I mean, she never um, stops and, and it, it slows down at all. So she's, she's always doing something. And I think she's definitely deserving of the award. It's really a blessing being able to be given this award. Like, I definitely didn't expect this, um, but it's still, it's still amazing to be selected. You know, Mr. Stephen Martin has left such an amazing impact on Tulane athletics and he really paved the way for student athletes like me, a person of color, um, to be able to play at such a great school academically. And also, he kind of shed or like showed us how to pay that forward and give that back to other people who, who need the, um, who need to be uplifted as well. You know, it's uh, it's very. Uh, I'm very grateful. You know, just to be associated with you know Stephen Martin's name and. You know, to have people view me and, you know, perceive me as someone who's, you know, civil-minded and a leader and great leadership qualities is, is really humbling. Sincere is a, a team captain. Not very often do you have a, he was almost a unanimous uh, uh, voted a team captain. One of the guys, an underclassman and uh, just an incredible leader, very involved in our uh, wave of change. Uh, group that we talk about uh, social injustice and different things like that and great student a great player a great person they just they couldn't have found a better person to, to represent uh, Stephen Martin and everything that uh, he did here at Tulane in this award I've seen a lot of you know including myself you know athletes of color um, you know building on top of his legacy more so than you know trying to make sure inclusion and diversity moves on and keeps growing rather than you know we're not really just satisfied with the great leap he made we want to keep taking that forward and continue bringing his legacy on really great feature there on this year's recipients of the stephen and martin scholars 35 7 big lead for two lane more to come after this screen wave up big at halftime A lot of great things going on at uh, South Florida. The Bulls not playing too well today, but they're unveiling a, a new locker room pretty soon. For more on that, we've got a piece for you. Thirty-five seven, the lead for Tulane over South Florida at halftime. Jack Benjamin, Brian Kitchen, back with you. And well, Brian, that was a, a pretty dominant offensive performance. The Green Wave score on their first five <laughs> offensive drives. South Florida, believe it or not, had the first points in this game, but uh, it was all Green Wave after that. Yeah, we thought it might just be a blow for blow there for a minute, but South Florida decided to shut it down offensively and Tulane has to be credited for that and being able to figure it out and Tulane being as productive as, as I've seen them ever offensively to start a football game to score on their first five possessions and not just score but score touchdowns that's really kind of a shocker but as I was talking to coach Fritz 
Gotta finish. That doesn't mean a thing if you can't finish. Three touchdown passes in that first half for Michael Pratt, including one there to Tyreek James. Couple of touchdown runs for Tajay Spears. And like he was saying, when you get the balance of the run game and the pass game the way they did, you're going to be tough to beat. It makes the defense have to defend the entire field from boundary to boundary. And when you're effective in all phases and in all areas and you have a quarterback who's moving the football out quickly and an offensive line that's not allowing pressure, there's not much more you can do. And they're going to have to work with some serious halftime adjustments, not just defensively for the South Florida Ball Club, but offensively as well. They've got to score points if they're going to get out of this hole, which is the only answer. And, and no matter how many times you shut them down on defense, you got to score points. You see those first half stats brought to you by Geico. The numbers pretty much all in favor of Tulane. The only one that's not is the time of possession, but obviously USF couldn't do a whole lot with those 17 and a half minutes with the ball. Yeah, they had the time of possession, but that was about it. Tulane's already eclipsed their passing average for the year for a game and almost eclipsed it as in the run game as well, even though they haven't ran the ball this year as effectively as they did last year. Last uh, penalties have been kind of a minimal factor. Turnovers have not factored in the equation at all. We've only had the interception early on by McLean, but every team has had equal possessions, but Tulane has turned them into points. The Green Wave also deferred to the second half, so they get the ball here to start the third, and Jaquan Jackson will let that kick sail over his head. And so the ball to the 25 for the Green Wave. Michael Pratt in that first half, we were talking about the numbers and how staggering they were. He was 15 for 17 for 230 and three touchdowns, started six for six, completed his final eight. Why was he so effective? He didn't have much. It was on the defense side. They had receivers running open down the field. And as I said earlier, he had his choice of receiver on occasion not just his choice, but his choice for who was going to score, running free on the top of that secondary. So that secondary for South Florida needs to buckle down and be able to sure up these receivers for Tulane. They hand it off on first down to Taji Spears, tries to reverse field, and then brought down. Short tackle there. That's the least resistance, or the most resistance we've seen from South Florida all game long. Obviously a very fire and brimstone speech from their head coach, Jeff Scott, getting them riled up. And Tulane's got to figure out how to finish this game off and finish strong. But Kyle LaPointe, the stop. Loss of a yard. Spears again and pulled down again. That's big Rashawn Yates, 6'3", 280 out of Port St. Lucie, Florida and a strong defensive start here to the third for South Florida. Yeah, they're penetrating that offensive line for Tulane that has not been overly effective. We talked about it, except for the last couple of games, running the football or protecting the passer. And South Florida has come out with a little bit of fire in their britches, ready to go. Green wave four for five on third down in that first half, and that is dropped. Through the hands of Matt Watts. Looked like that ball was delivered pretty well there to Pratt. And a punt is upcoming for Tulane. Yeah, nice delivery. Brought pressure there. We haven't seen much from South Florida. Good throw. Right where it needed to be toward the boundary. A little low and away. And that's why you have your scholarship. Because you're a receiver. Not a dropper. But everybody has a mistake every now and again. I'm sure he wants that one back. Ryan Wright last week punted eight times, 398 total punt yards. He had two go over 60. Fair catch is waved for and made by Xavier Weaver. And so South Florida gets the defensive stop they need to start this third quarter. Again, if you're just joining us, Tulane scored the final 35 points of that first half after USF Got a 24-yard touchdown run from Kelly Joyner. And since that point, their offense just wasn't able to get anything going. Timmy McLean struggled, just the one interception. 
what do they have to do to be more effective here in the second half? I think you have to credit that to Tulane's defense. They've been playing that man coverage in the passing game and not giving McLean anywhere to go with the football, throwing it in. They haven't been effective running the ball down the, the middle of that Tulane defense as well. So it's a tough answer for them because they just don't have it. And they haven't gotten Jaron Mangum going. That's a loss of one. Adonis Freelu has been all over the place. That's his second TFL today. And Mangum's their leading rusher, the guy that we talked about always falls forward, makes yards after contact. And he's a difference maker, but they just can't seem to get anything going in the running game. And try it again, and again, nothing doing. Another stop from Tulane. That time it's Angelo Anderson. And USF, who today are six for 11 on third down with a third and long again. They've just been in this situation too much today. Yeah, they, uh, Tulane is playing that gap defense. Everybody's responsible for one, and every one of them's occupied with a body in the run game. You're not going to have success, and now you put yourself in a third and a really long. Green wave, rush five. McLean throws off the hands of Horn. Would have been a tough catch to make, but he's a skilled guy. We talked about their connection going back to their high school days at Seminole High. A couple of drops today from Moore. Not sure you call that one. That was a tough play to make. And still another punt. And you just can't be trading punts here when you're down 28. No, he either can't. It was a really good throw, though. He threw it right in between Canada, their, their freshman nickelback, and Brooks. And really good throw. Just got to make the catch. You saw two drops on third down. And last two possessions for both football teams and South Florida just really can't afford to do that. Fifth punt today for Andrew Stokes, the Australian. This will take a bit of a USF bounce to the 35-yard line. It goes 40-yard punt. Tulane's offense back on the field after this. Well, South Florida's run 14 more plays today than Tulane. They've had the ball five minutes more, and yet they are down by 28 because the Green Wave are averaging about 10 yards per play. Yeah, they're hitting on all cylinders ex with the exception of their last series where they had a net negative one yard in offense. And we got to worry about that complacency. I asked Willie Fritz about it. You want to be able to be consistent regardless of the score throughout the ball game. Pratt on the option. And a big hole there, and Pratt takes off for 14. We've seen him run effectively a couple times today, another first down. Well, the good thing there for Michael Pratt is that he didn't get hit, and he gets hit quite a bit. And sometimes you don't understand it. I love that he's gritty and tough, but quarterback's got to be there and play in and play out game in and game out. And getting hit doesn't help that fact. Pratt to throw, some pressure coming, and down he goes. So USF gets home there, Rashawn Yates. Second TFL, his first sack of the day, and a loss of seven. He's working against the right guard there, Caleb Thomas, and really does a good job of getting to him. Pratt had his target earlier, but pulled it down to try to get out of there. Something he hadn't had a whole lot of opportunity to do which is get to his second and third receivers over the course of the season second and 17 and this is Spears and not a whole lot of room and you know this has to be frustrating I'm looking at Willie Fritz walking the boundary got his head down shaking it because this isn't what he wanted to see that brief interview we did at the end of the first half said it all and there's a reason he said it because when you have a lead like that, that's why I asked the question. Are you worried about complacency? And it's exactly what he said. We have to finish. And third and 18 isn't going to do it. Pressure again on Pratt. They roll him this time across the middle. That's intercepted. An easy pick for Christian Williams. He had ankle surgery after he was hurt in the opener against NC State. 
He's got his second interception in as many weeks after picking off Desmond Ritter on the first drive a week ago, and USF is in business. Yeah, he was out four or five weeks, and he's had some issue about where he's supposed to be in alignment because he hasn't had the experience that a player would normally have through the course of the season, but Michael Pratt made it easy for him. He locked on the Jaquan Jackson crossing, very similar to what happened to McLean earlier in the game and did not see the backside defender sitting right there and threw it up for an easy pick. South Florida, 2-8 and eight on the year. Just one win in the American. And Tulane just 1-9, and nine, eight straight losses. McLean on the move. USF looking to generate something, and he can't do it. Down he goes. Noah Sidon got him. Another sack for the Green Wave today. That's I, their fifth. I hate to use the term, but it's true. It was a jailbreak. There was, they didn't have any, didn't have anything. And man coverage down the field as they've done all day. There's nowhere for McLean to go with the football. And even though he escapes temporarily, he has nowhere to throw the football. And they don't have an answer for this two-lane defense that is playing really well. After a loss of seven, it's Horn on a slant. And only a short gain. We were talking to Chris Hampton, Tulane's defensive coordinator, Brian, earlier in the week, and I was asking him, look, what's changed for you guys? It was pretty simple. The tackling has gotten better. Guys know their assignments. They're locked in. They're taking pride. They've been dealt some short fields, and they are locked and loaded today. And communication was another huge factor because if the secondary doesn't know where they're supposed to be and guys don't know what those fronts are that they're getting and those looks they're getting and being able to communicate that they have no success on third and 14 McLean is driven down again ball, ball is loose Sidon dove for it couldn't get there Eric Hicks with the sack his first of the year and this two lane defense making all kinds of plays they can't be stopped and this is playing into the favor of Tulane because Tulane, all they've got to do is get this South Florida offense off the field and game's over. Hicks has a couple of TFLs in that sack. Another punt for Stokes. It's a good punt that'll drive Jackson back around his 22, and he is immediately drilled. Tulane defense playing inspired football here in Senior Day up big. Senior Day here in New Orleans at Uleman Stadium, and Tulane's defense has shown up in a big way. Five sacks to tie a season high. A couple on that last series. They're up by 28. Well, I have four possessions for both of these teams in this half at negative seven yards and zero points, as opposed to the first half, where both these teams in four possessions at 172 yards and 21 points. Where did this game go? It's disappeared. We're at our halftime score of 35-7. Michael Pratt back to work. Floats one deep, and that is caught. Beautiful throw and catch to Shea Wyatt. 27-yard gain, and Wyatt's become a go-to guy today, his fourth catch. Yeah, he had point the free safety, and Williams, the cornerback, in cover three right over the top of both of them on the corner route, and Pratt laid it right in there. Way of going quick. They pitch it to Carroll. He was shaken up earlier, so good to see him back in the game. Maybe got a yard, and he's hobbled. You can see it. Looks like a different injury. You're right. Not going to say what, but looks like a different injury. We roll under eight to go in this third quarter. it off to Carroll again another short gain run defense has certainly been better here for South Florida in the third quarter what have they done to shore things up a little bit South Florida 
Well, I think it's more on Tulane's side. I, like I said, it's just complacency. I think when you have a lead like that, it's the thing you have to fight against the most. And it happens on all levels of football. Even in the NFL, when you get up by a couple of scores, you, you, you find that you just kind of rest on what you've done, and then it enables the other offensive or the other side of the football to be able to, to score points and bring the game back. Obviously, this one's a little bit out of reach. On third and seven, that's complete to Jackson, but he went backwards. You know, with forward progress, I'm not sure he was to the marker, but he would have been much closer. And so that'll bring up fourth down. Now, you're on the plus side of the 50, but when you're up by 28 points, this means punting units coming out for Willie Fritz's group. But I can't help but keep going back to that question I asked Willie because I know how it is as a coach. I coached for a brief period of time, not at this level, but I know how it works. And you don't want to see things like this happen. You still got another ball game to play next week, and you certainly don't want to set a precedent or set a tone for your football team that when we get up, we can't perform. And it looks like what's happened here with this two-lane offense has just hit a brick wall. We'd love to give credit to South Florida, but I just don't know that that's it. You've also got quite a weapon in punter Ryan Wright. There's a flag down after that punt landed inside the tent. Ryan Wright, one of the best to ever do it at Tulane. On track to set the single season record for yards per punt. Yeah, just last week he had a 65 yarder and four inside the 20. That's nah, just a light day for him. <laughs> Sure, he's happy he hasn't been as busy today. Here's the kick. Personal foul. Block out of bounds. Number 21. Receiving team. At the distance from the kick. Be first down. Timeout on the field. So the call goes against Jalen Stokes. 557 to go in the third. Green Wave still a big. Five, seven, the lead for Tulane over South Florida. Five punts in this third quarter. Three by the Green Wave have punted just once in that first half. They still lead by 28 points. Both of these defenses have locked in, and it's been an offensive struggle. Just one first down in the third quarter. Yeah, this is a totally different ball game than we saw in the first half on both sides of the football, especially Tulane. So South Florida from its own four. They run it with Mangum, and not a whole lot doing. South Florida entered this drive negative 12 yards in this quarter. Tulane with 35. And I'll tell you all you need to know. Yeah, Everything. having as many punt, punts as the entire first half already after our, this is our fifth, sixth possession. We already had five of them. Crazy. It's been a struggle to get their leading rusher, Jaron Mangum, going. They motion the tight end, Carter. Fake it to Mangum. There is Carter in the flat, and he's out to about the 11 yard line. Give him a gain of six. And we were talking about. These games being more important for the offseason for both of these football teams. And Jeff Scott is ending his second year here in South Florida. You know, you don't want to go into a game. You're playing the 10th ranked team in the American Conference, and you're the 9th ranked team, and you're getting stroked by them. It's not exactly what he wants to see heading into the offseason for this football team going into year three of his program. McLean throws, Atkins catches, lost the football. Now is he down? They're going to say that he was. It was Jalen Monroe running that ball into the end zone, but they're going to say he was down. He was reaching for the first down. Yeah, knees down, knees down. Looked like the right knee. 
looked a lot closer if you don't look at the knee. But really, a good play by him. He just kind of, you need to secure the football when you do it. Rudy Dyson knocked that ball free. They will review this. Our replay official is Thomas Considine. And another look. And the ball is out there, but you can't see the knee. Yeah, that other look was a better look. And I don't know. I think it's closer than we initially thought. I agree. I might have to backtrack on my call this one and think that it's going to be reversed because it came out rather quickly. Yeah, it's already now, loose. Yes. Yeah, that's... Not a huge fan of the old instant replay, though. You're not? Yeah, I think it's made referees more complacent. I think they depend upon the camera and the aftermath of the call, and I don't think it makes them as sharp. I can kind of use an analogist that we can use, which is a live open versus a taped open. When you know you're live, guess <laughs> what? You got to nail it, and if you screw it up, guess what? Power through. But when you're on tape, you can you can know you can have a little backtrack, and you can redo it and do it again. So. I think that it's very similar that when they know they have the backup, they're not as definite in their call and they're not as sharp as they have been. I, I think that's over the landscape of football because I think you get it just as much wrong in replay as you do in live action calling it and letting it stand. And so for me, it's a momentum killer. It's a, it's a time elongator, if that's even a word, for a game. <laughs> and I just think we need to go back to where it was and have somebody who sits there, and if there's an egregious missed call, we overturn it. But all this stuff, just let the guys do the job. And if this human error comes into it, then it does. And that's the way it is. And they do reverse the call. You know, we didn't see it on our initial look. Got a couple of replay looks, and, and there's no doubt that ball was loose. He was stretching for the first down. You appreciate the effort there from Atkins, but that ball is out. That's a heck of a play by Rudy Dyson to help jar it free. Second year freshman from Kentwood. Now it should have been a touchdown, but the play was blown dead, remember? That's yeah. part of the issue too with the, the whole replay system. I agree. That's a situation where it's really gotta be six points for Tulane. Instead, their offense will take over at the 15. Holes is the motion man. Pratt fires wide open. Spears makes a cut inside the 10. And Spears becomes, how about this, the ninth different green wave receiver to catch a pass today. Spreading the wealth. You got to love that. I remember when I was at LSU, I had a all-american wide receiver and they used to dish it to him every play i'm like wait a minute <laughs> like i'm here i'm open over the middle we could throw me a ball or two which they did but nice to see him spreading it around carroll with space and cameron carroll is in for six from eight yards out that's his second touchdown today He's got one through the air, and now one on the ground. And the Green Wave have put up 40 points in this game, 41 unanswered. Well, you talk about having a short field, a 15-yard line is about as short.
season like this it just simply has not happened in his 29 years as head coach. He's Missouri at the D2 level, at Sam Houston State, reaching a couple FCS title games. The success at Georgia Southern and elsewhere, too. And obviously here, three straight bowl games entering the year. He was telling us, there's not going to be quitting this team. I won't allow it. And they have come out and they've played inspired football today. And this is the kind of effort you need on your home turf, especially on senior day. Without a doubt, I agree with that 100%. But I'm still just surprised. I would have never predicted this to be the case of this football game. South Florida has been starting inside of 20 pretty much every time on these kickoffs. And and Matt, he was number 21, was trying to tell him to stay in there. Don't come out. And he came out. And it didn't work well. Yeah, you'd rather it on the 25 for sure. But it hadn't really mattered where they started. They have been very unproductive with only one touchdown to show for their efforts on offense. And I can surely say that all the stops are out because we no longer have... Timmy McLean in the game. We have Cade Horton in a quarterback. He throws here on a swing pass. That's Batty. Out of bounds around the 25. So. In 2019, actually 2018, was a day away from signing with Syracuse after entering the transfer. Scott got the job at USF and say, hey, why? To Tampa, and, well, he's now got a couple years left of eligibility. The run by Batty, he's got a first down. Good luxury to have a guy who was in a Power 5 school as a backup. Yeah, I'll say, and I know that probably wasn't the game plan until they saw McLean come in in the spring and kind of knew what they wanted to do with the future of their program and handed him the reins, and I'm sure that didn't sit well with Cade, who's a youngster, still only a sophomore. But obviously getting a chance here in this game of really no consequence to see what he can do with his offense. Joyner has a gain of about 15. Flag was down. That was a late green wave player running off Darius Hodges. Couldn't get off the field. 16 yards officially on the run. So a run of 16 there for Joyner. Look at the clients, 12 men on the field. You know, that won't make Willie Fritz happy. Even when you're up by 35, it's all the little details, right? Well, that's what I kept saying. Even the, the way that this offense, two-lane offense is, is sputtered, that's, that's frustrating for a coach. Dallison's the motion man. Joyner blowing up in the backfield. Another TFL. This is a loss of four on a huge hit by Keith Cooper, true freshman from Dickinson, Texas. And it's so many different guys that have been in the defensive backfield today. They have been tenacious, to say the least, on that defensive side of the football for Tulane. Young freshman making his presence known. the numbers in this third quarter for USF. This is Joyner. He's really been the guy to get a little bit going on the grounds. You know, Mangum is that powerful back. We talked about his strength and we talked about the rushing touchdowns, but he doesn't have a rushing score over nine. Joyner is kind of the guy who can break runs. Had the one in the first quarter. They have bottled him up those since. Yeah, Mangum's got more meat on his bones. It's not the long distance kind of back that you're looking for. More of a power guy inside the tackles. South Florida missed on their last five third downs. They're six for 14 for the game. Two lanes man coverage on the edges. That throw is in the vicinity of Brinkman, the tight end, but behind him. And the punting unit's coming out for USF, and this thing has pretty much spiraled for this offense that has been able to generate all of about 20 yards in this third quarter. 
Yeah, we see McLean on the boundary. He's healthy. I just guess they're giving this guy another chance to get some reps under his belt. You probably will see that on both sides of the field of guys getting in the game that maybe haven't had opportunity, especially as it gets late and further along. So those defensive numbers, seven TFLs for the game for Tulane. Punt here from Stokes. Jaquan Jackson waves for a fair catch. Well, join us on Black Friday for some American football action. Number five, Cincinnati heads to Greenville to face East Carolina at 3.30 Eastern on ABC. Also at 3.30 Eastern over on ESPN, South Florida takes I, the I-4 over to Orlando to square off with UCF. Then don't forget, the season culminates with the AAC Championship game Saturday, December 4th at 4 Eastern on ABC. A couple of big games remaining. How about Cincinnati hoping to keep their playoff chances alive? Of course, have to win out and see what happens committee-wise. They're on the outside looking in right now. Play SMU today. This is Spears. Short game. So we waited until the final minute here of the third. What's your take on Cincinnati right now? Well, Cincinnati is getting exposed to the likes of what Alabama sees every week and what Georgia sees every week and what top-ranked teams see every week, which is you're going to get everybody's best game. And you can't just stroll into some other team's territory and expect them just to lay down. You're going to get their best. And so as much as this, the percentages are in their favor, just like complacency in the course of a game when you're up by touchdowns, that can happen in a season as well where you show up flat. I mean, my senior year, we lost to Miami of Ohio. <laughs> and we were like, what? So it can happen. So they just need to be prepared week in and week out for whoever they face because they're going to show up. Well, not much complacency defensively in that third quarter for Willie Fritz's group. They got after the quarterback. Jimmy McLean's had a tough day. Green wave up by 35. We head to the fourth in New Orleans. Trying to snap this eight game losing streak of the green wave. Tulane rolling here at home on senior day, trying to snap their eight game losing streak, hoping for their first win in the AAC. Michael Pratt leading the way for this offense, up 35 points as we start the fourth. He's 18 for 22 today through the air. And he will pass again. Now run on first down. And out of bounds he goes. After a short game, about a six yard pickup actually. So did good to use his feet there. You know, he's a guy, we were talking about this earlier, Brian, but was homeschooled through the end of eighth grade. Didn't play football growing up. He was a baseball player. So had to work hard to shorten his release for football and get the ball out quick. And, Boy, he's gotten the ball out quick today. There's no question about that. Had a terrific career over at uh, Boca Raton, three years there. Moved over to Deerfield Beach. And this is really his best performance so far in his second year starting for the Green Wave. 18 for 22 and 265 through the year. Yeah, if I'm Chip Long, this is what I want to see the rest of the game. Wildcat, do not let Michael Pratt run the football. Tajay Spears breaking a couple of tackles. He still looks like he's he's got something going on. Now Spears has had such a good run here of late. He's over 100 yards today officially. That's his third 100-yard game now over the course of his past four. And Agaya, you think about what he's overcome, had that devastating ACL injury week three against Southern Miss. He rushed for 200-yard games to start last season, Brian, went down against Southern Miss, had the battle back. He said there were times because of how difficult his rehab was, he thought about quitting football. And that's the second one he's had in his career. So that's even more impressive about where he's come from. Pratt toward the sideline and coming back for Jaquan Jackson. Open field inside the 20 and down to the 15 yard line. It's his second catch of the day. And it goes for 46. And he's running against Christian Williams, the corner, and he got his head back just a little bit late, and unable to make a play on the ball. 
and did a good job of tracking him down, but Jackson high points the ball, comes back underneath it, a perfect back shoulder throw by Pratt because he was covered up pretty good. There was nowhere to go, and that back shoulder is tough to defend. Career high, 311 yards passing for Michael Pratt today. Hand off to Iverson Celestine, true freshman from Mandeville, gets his 15th carry of the year. Most of that came in the blowout win week two over Morgan State. Yeah, got high praise from Willie Fritz. Said the guy's really gonna be good. Young put some size on him. He's got the speed for sure. All-time leading rusher at Fountain Blue High School, Brian. 4,171 yards. Is that it? 4,000? I was thinking oh the same gosh. thing. Man, can't Green. even imagine that much, that much yardage. Greenwave knocking on the door again. Fade pattern for Tolls. Did he hold on? No, it was Fat Watts, actually. Fat Watts held on in the end zone. Touchdown, Greenwave. Number four on the day for Pratt. What a beauty that was. Chip Long calls him one of his playmakers. And I give all the credit in the world to Pratt for that throw. But I'm also going to give some kudos, if not more, to this catch. Because these are difficult. Right over the top of his helmet. And it's right on the boundary, being aware of where he was on the field, making the catch, getting the foot in. Nice execution on both sides of that throw. Six plays, 80 yards. Looks like they're going to take a look at the catch. Under further review. Plays under review here, so I'll take a look. Looked pretty good from our vantage point. We'll see it again. Now, you mentioned Watts being a playmaker. Career-long 49-yard catch for a touchdown in the fourth quarter last week. Working on Isaiah Cromarty. Looked like he dragged that foot, controlled the ball. And he says that you're too small. <laughs> but Cromarty is 6'1". Fat Watts is six foot tall, according to my uh, numbers here. But hey, when you make a catch like that, you can say what you want. Yeah, their receiving core, the highest, the tallest guy they got is 6'2". There's no real real beast out there out wide, but these guys can motor and they can make plays. But as we talked about with Willie, you know, they just need, haven't been able to get on man coverage, have press coverage this year. Just It's been an issue for them and obviously the protection has played into that. But again, going back to replay, it's I don't know. I, I, might, I may be the only one in the history of, or maybe the only one in, <laughs> in the country that's against instant replay, but I just I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Human error is always a part of sports. I mean, they don't do right. an electronic strike zone, do they, in baseball, right? They don't do that, do they? Do they do an electric strike zone? And right now, no. no. They people don't. People but have, but you have could been, do it. People you have could, been clamoring for it. You could do it. But, <laughs> but people want that human element still involved. Right. And I will say this. I didn't see this on the initial look. That ball did get bobbled on his chest. I think he may have still got a foot down by the time he controlled it. I it was definitely it. bobbled. Yeah. Without question. He didn't catch it clean. Right. But he had it He had right. it secured by the time that foot got down. You know, one right. dynamic we haven't mentioned, the Watts brothers, you know, Deuce and Fad are obviously twins. Both started at Jones County Junior College. Asked Willie Fritz about getting them over here. You know, at, at Tulane, you can have a pretty high GPA to get in here. It was easy yeah. to get them in. He said you got to transfer <laughs> over, what, 12 credit hours per semester and... It's rare. I think he said they're looking at two guys in the whole country as far as junior colleges have, this year. You have to have at least a 30, and the average at the school is 32. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's like insane. It's absolutely insane. After review, the receiver did not have control of the ball before going out of bounds. The incomplete pass will be 39 at the 15-yard line. Well, there you go. And I'll admit it, I'm 0 for 2 on these replays today. Well, I didn't really have an opinion on this one because I didn't think it was even that close because, yeah, he bobbles it, but I guess he never gets it He never gets it secured and it goes to his waist right as he's coming down. Slid down his leg just a bit, they said. So they buzz it in. It gets overturned. Take the touchdown pass off the board for Pratt. And 
now he's swallowed up. Good job there by the USF defense. A couple guys in there to make the stop. Mikhail Point. Yeah, I don't. I just go Wildcat, man. I, 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 when I see my guy getting hit, it's just hard for me because I've watched him all year just get banged up. Blake Green in on that stop as well. So yep. Merrick Glover will try for what's going to be a 36-yard field goal. Remember, he missed earlier from 32. He's missed his last couple now, dating back to last week. Can he get back on track? This one is away, and this one is good. He needed that. Good for him on his final home game here at Tulane. Merrick Glover from 36. 45 points on the board for the Green Wave. Forty-five unanswered points for the two-lane green wave trying to stop their eight-game losing streak. South Florida fans making the trip, not having too good of a time. Their team scored first in this game in all green wave since. A field goal moments ago by Merrick Glover. It was 35-7 at halftime. Another kick on the ground. And fielded again by Brinkman. He's led the team in returns today. Trying to keep the ball away from one of the most electrifying men in the country, in Batty. And so this USF offense back to work. We saw Keith Fortin in there taking over last series, Brian, for Timmy McLean. And he is coming out again. So we'll see if they can get something going here offensively. Look, at this point, you're just trying to see who you got, what you got going into next year, what you got going into next week. Yeah, these plays are going to be looked at just as scrutiny, scrutinous as all the other ones throughout the course of the game come film time. Hand off to Batty, and you can see his explosiveness. Down across the 40. Gain of 11. Player is hurt here for Tulane. They'll attend to him. 11.05 left in this fourth quarter. And we will step aside. 45 to 7 early in the fourth here in New Orleans. South Florida, but a long-time Clemson connection for him. Wide receiver and holder fought his way into a nice spot, and then the wide receivers coach before becoming offensive coordinator for five years. His son named Hunter, born the 10th of August of last year. Of course, Hunter Renfro catching the game-winning touchdown to secure Clemson's first national title in the 2016 college football playoff. In the corner of the end zone in Raymond James Stadium. So the story goes, he and his wife Sarah wanted some kind of connection to connect Clemson and Tampa. And well, there you go, just name him Hunter. And they uh, did get a picture eventually of the two of them. Hunter Renfro, of course, plays for the Raiders now. And young Hunter Scott as well. So that's really a fun story. So is the fact that I have a son named Hunter and with no relevant story, like. <laughs> A bad, it's not like a bad deal. I feel I feel bad. I don't have a better story for it. You're slacking off. I just I just like the name Hunter. <laughs> so I guess I, it's a good name. Another TFL for the Green Wave. That's their eighth today. That's Macon Clark who had a pick earlier. Yeah, Jeff Scott. We were talking to him about his time at Clemson and all that he learned there. Of course, part of the uh, story too with him, you know, he was. Um, at Clemson and of course had just come off uh, the national title and had met a couple at USF at the time because of the Tampa connection and he really had a great day when he got offered the USF job. His wife Sarah was actually, uh, she found out she was pregnant with eventually who would become Hunter. There is Batty near the 40 yard line so that's a heck of a day you find out your wife is pregnant with soon to be your first son and you get offered the job at USF he accepted a day later. Yeah, every coach that coaches, with rare exception, wants to be a head coach at some point. And when you have that opportunity, I'm sure it's a very memorable, 
memorable time in your life to be able to get that transition from a position coach to a to a head coach position. Kate Fortin on the rollout finds Chris Clark. Chris Carter, beg your pardon, gain of one. Yeah, that seems to be the play of choice for the for the day. They've seen we've seen that three or four times this afternoon. Botched a couple of last names there. Megan Clark made the tackle on Chris Carter. So it's a gain of a yard. A USF team that is staring in eighth straight conference road loss in the eyes here today. Inside nine to play now. They're on the move finally. Fortin throws a dart incomplete. Looking for Demarcus Gregory over the middle. And I feel for him. I, every receiver, all three receivers in routes were completely covered by the two lane defenders. There was no white jersey he could even hardly see. And he still made the try to try to squeeze it in there. But that's just two lane. They've been playing like that all day today. Really been done a good job of covering them up, even in man coverage now. Third and nine, covering them up. Seven for 16 today on third down. They run it with Joyner, tries to bounce it to the edge. And he is pulled down. Good tackle in space. That is Jaden Kennedy again, a true freshman from Jacksonville who continues to impress. Third leading tackler this year is a true freshman. They're going for it. On fourth down and a short joiner, I think with that second push, he got just enough. And I think that word, just enough, is about right, because it was barely enough. By the skin of his teeth there. They roll towards eight to go. Clock will keep on ticking. Now you think about USF now, Brian, and see if they can find momentum here down the stretch, but the war on I-4 next week, too. They're arch rivals from UCF. you got to try to find something. And what do you think the biggest things Jeff Scott will be thinking about heading into next week in terms of adjustments? Man, he, he's, got a, he's got a plethora of things on his plate because they couldn't do anything on either side of the football. The bright spot they had coming in was their return guy who had, I think he had a couple of them today, got out one out to the 50-yard line, and it looked like they, they were, they're as solid as they could be in their return game, but that's not going to win you football games. You're going to have to be able to put up points and stop people from scoring on you, and they've given up. They've done it both ways today. They throw it on second and nine. Atkins breaks a tackle. It was Holden Willis breaking a tackle. Gets inside the 10, first and goal for the Bulls. You'd like to get some guys some reps. That was only, I think, his third catch of the year. Getting guys some PT that normally wouldn't get it, but you certainly would like to do it on the other end, leading and not trailing. Yeah, each of his three catches the last couple weeks. Fortin throwing, fade pattern incomplete. target was Sincere Brown. And we talked about this earlier in the game, the red, uh, the red zone just being a tough area of the field where windows get tight and play action is your best friend. But they haven't been able to move the football on the ground, so it might not do them much good. Second and goal. Fortin on the keeper, throws late and off the hands of Willis. So how about that, an option late pass? Yeah, you don't see that very often. It looked like he had committed to the run and then decided to get it out to his receiver. And I'm sure there had to be an O-lineman downfield or two. But I was going to ask, is that how they drew it up? Couldn't have been. Had to be a last minute decision. So they're seven for 17 today on third down. Was that Michael Scott on their uh, play sign there? A little office reference, okay. Inside 10 in the play clock. Third and goal at the nine, they run it with Joyner. And down he goes. 
this two-lane defense has just been so locked in today. Dorian Williams, Fort Mills, South Carolina native, second team all-conference a year ago. And here's fourth down and goal. And of course, you're going for it here if you're Jeff and, Scott. And you're going to man up across the board. There's nobody deep. Your receivers are going to have to win right here, and they're going to have to keep Tulane from getting to the quarterback, which I just don't see happening. On fourth and goal, Fortin steps up. Now he runs into the end zone, standing up from nine yards on fourth and goal. Cade Fortin with his first career touchdown. And USF stops the string of 45 straight Tulane points. They've got a second score today on the road. Well, this was the only option he had left was to use his legs because Tulane, like I said, man coverage. And when you're in man coverage or you don't have anybody deep looking up for run support. <laughs> Spencer Schrader for the point after. He missed that field goal in the first half from 51. That was the first kick he has missed all year, field goal or extra point. Kate Fortin leads a nice drive for USF. They get back on the board, 45-14 late in the fourth. The Bulls men's basketball season continues Wednesday as South Florida hosts Hampton at the Youngling Center. That's Wednesday night at 7 Eastern, 6 Central, and only on ESPN+. Plus. Pretty good effort from USF last night. Only fell by 6 to 21st ranked Auburn at home. Jack Benjamin, Brian Kinchin back with you. String of 45 straight points for Tulane came to a close with a Cade Fortin touchdown run moments ago. That'll feel good for USF to get something going in the second half. Hasn't been a whole lot for those fans to cheer about today. Yes, anything is better than nothing. And I just feel for the head coach. How, how, what do you do after this? How do you, because you're coming into year three next year. And at current state, three wins under your belt. And it's just tough. I talked about wanting to win out the last couple of games. It's not going to happen on the South Florida side for sure. So this two-lane offense back to work. Got to stay in bounds there, guys. A yeah, short run for Celestine. Well, I think it would be fitting if Tulane could run the clock out because then South Florida would have scored on their opening drive and their last drive, which we would have never predicted, and Tulane scored all the ones <laughs> in between. <laughs> That's one way to put it. Yes. Yes. Clock will tick here towards five to go in the game. Michael Pratt is still out there, 19 for 24 for 311 and three touchdowns. Hands off again, Celestine again. Little bit of a crease. That ball pop out at the end? It did. He was already down. Yeah, it looked like a knee was down. Then again, I thought a knee was down earlier and it was ruled a fumble. This is true. The late in this ball game, we talk about Willie Fritz and this team and this program. You know, we were mentioning it. His 29th year as a college coach. This is only going to be his fifth season finishing below 500. His fewest wins, of course, as we mentioned. But you win this game, and obviously you got you got to go to the Liberty Bowl next week. A, a tough place to play over in Memphis. But boy, if you can string together a couple of wins, you have the young quarterback. You have some pieces on offense. A season that really was a disappointment for a while with so many close defeats and, and really the way it started off sort of spiraled on them but it's amazing what a couple of end of season wins can do for your momentum going into the offseason being displaced early because of the hurricane that's no nobody wants to have to go through that and endure that and you have no idea how that affected your team and uh, the whole season really it's not an excuse, but you're right. Winning late gives you momentum going into the offseason, and 
He's such a good guy, Willie. He signed that seven-year extension, talking about this might be his last coaching job ever. And it's just a great place in uptown New Orleans. Such a beautiful stadium, a beautiful campus. Great place to be. But it's a tough place to win because of your academic requirements and your, your walk-on status. You just don't get the same quality or quantity, more or less, of the walk-ons because of the cost of what it takes to go to this university. Right. It's hard to shell out that kind of money when you want to go walk on to play football. And so he just doesn't get the numbers. And it's just hard for him. It's a very difficult place. But I had high expectations for them. I called that Morgan State game earlier in the season and really thought we'd see more out of them. But you just don't know. It's And he, he was talking about it earlier because I was talking about the 18 to 20-year-olds. He says, they get a bad rap. I think they get a bad rap. And he, he's talking about how his team has been so resilient and how they've played so hard and been so diligent in their work ethic and, and how they've gone about this season, even though they've had no success. And that's why, for me, after that first half, it was just nice to see them have success because everybody works hard every week, every day, every moment. But you don't always see the, the rewards of your hard work. And when you see five straight possessions that end up in touchdown, that's a pretty productive half, pretty productive game, which is what basically it'll end up being. But, you know, he's just a good guy, great institution. Yeah, got a young quarterback and some elements that can help you build upon, especially with these wins late. They've kept it on the ground on this drive, continuing to churn some clock. And is Mason Courtney, freshman from Carthage, Texas. Yeah, he was talking to us about these guys have not quit. They've put in the work, and you needed to bear fruit at some point with a win. And they're going to get that today. They're going to get it in dominant fashion. They gave up the early touchdown. They settled in defensively, and the offense took advantage of a couple of turnovers. And obviously, when the offense slowed down in the third, the defense was there to back them up. And here they are again with a minute 20 to go. Courtney is tripped up. I think Thad Mangum got in there again. He had that TFL earlier. 6'2", 275. One of a couple of seventh-year guys on the USF roster. Getting some reps for guys that don't see much PT. Well, they can run this thing down to about 30 seconds, but they'll have to punt, so... Billy Fritz always coaching. They can take this down to about 34 or so seconds. Ryan Wright will punt one more time in his final home game. Let's see what he can do with it. Takes a hop and rolls just into the end zone. It was spinning like a top around the one. Tulane 28 seconds away from a home win. chance to lift this trophy and join this club. The Heisman Trophy Ceremony, Saturday at 8 on ESPN. Been tough sledding in New Orleans for Jeff Scott as a coach. You think about his couple of trips as an offensive coordinator with Clemson to New Orleans, the loss of the national title game to LSU in 2019 CFP title game, the Sugar Bowl loss back in 2018, and and now this, he's been outscored by quite a bit, too. And well, his team's got to find something here between weeks. They'll get ready for the war on I-4. And it really spiraled after an opening drive that was impressive and an opening touchdown. But it was Tulane's day. And on their senior day, for this 15-player senior class, they stop their eight-game losing streak. They knock off the South Florida Bulls. They get their first conference win, and now a whole bunch of momentum for Willie Fritz's crew heading to the Liberty Bowl to finish out the year at Memphis next week. It'll be, five. It, it'll be interesting to see if it carries over in this momentum offensively, and I think even especially defensively, they played so well here this afternoon. If that carries over into the last game and they get 
a really good stepping stone into that offseason, even though they're not going to be able to play in a bowl again this year, which was the hope to be four in a row. But really a nice outing for them for Tulane. 45 points on the board. They led 35-7 at halftime. I should say a 20, yeah, 35-7 at halftime. Obviously a balanced effort rushing and passing. 311 passing yards from Michael Pratt. And three touchdowns as well. Tulane women's basketball team looks to continue their unbeaten start later this afternoon when they take on South Alabama. Action will tip at 5 Eastern, 4 Central, only on ESPN+. Plus. So Tulane will try to sweep the day here in New Orleans. Lisa Stockton's crew off to a 3-0 start. And Willie Fritz's group that has worked so hard, you know what this means for all these seniors, and he knows it. You think about these guys, and you know, we were talking about some of the, you know, one guy we didn't mention, Corey Dublin, their left guard, he made his 60th start today. There's a lot of guys who stuck around that extra year. And they go out on a high note. And a 45-14 to 14 win for the Green Wave here today. That'll do it for us. For my partner, Brian Kitchen, our producer, Brian Duvall, and all of our terrific crew here, Jack Benjamin sings so long from New Orleans. Final score, Tulane 45, South Florida 14. All games airing on the ESPN networks are streaming live and archived on the ESPN app. This has been a presentation of ESPN. The Green Wave stopped their losing streak. They've got a conference win and a lot of momentum now to head to Memphis next week to close out the year.